Chapter 7, Show Me Your Future. I live in Missouri, and our state nickname is the Show Me State. That means that we tend to be skeptical. We know that words are cheap and that actions speak louder than words. In other words, you can tell me that you love me, but I'll know for sure when you show me some love. I also know that you can promise to be there for me, but I'll know for sure that you will when you actually show up for me in my time of need. The bottom line for a person from Missouri then is that you have to show me. That's when I'll know for sure that you're for real. If you really want to live for Christ, I want to share with you a great way to show that your commitment to live for him is real. And it's through your choice of friends. Your choice of friends will, quite simply, show everyone what your priorities are. And it can even determine the direction of your life. A wise friend of mine is fond of saying, Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Now, I suspect that some of you just read that and you feel awesome. You know that your future is bright because your friends are incredible, mask-free people who are role models of faith and love. And I suspect that some of you just read that line and are thinking, oh, snap, my future could be in big trouble. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that we should be friends only with people who are living saints. Jesus certainly hung out with all kinds of people, and he was a friend of sinners. So in following him, we should befriend all kinds of people, including those who might lack faith and those who are making bad choices. However, Jesus did have his group of 12 disciples, the ones he was closest to, and he shared his life more deeply and more intensely with them than anyone else on earth. They were his support system, and that's what I'm talking about, having a core group of people close to us that we can depend upon to support us in our faith, and with whom we can share our values. To live the Christian life in today's world, we need all the help we can get. And the encouragement of our peers is essential. St. John Bosco put it like this, Fly from bad companions as from the bite of a poisonous snake. If you keep good companions, I can assure you that you will one day rejoice with the blessed in heaven. Whereas if you keep with those who are bad, you will become bad yourself, and you will be in danger of losing your soul. One of the bigger blessings of my life is that for over a dozen years, I had the privilege of being an adult leader for a Catholic youth prayer group called God's Gang. Being a leader of this group changed my life, as well as the lives of most of the teenagers who faithfully attended. We met every Wednesday night for a couple of hours, and our format was simple. We began with music, praising and worshiping God. Then we had a commercial, which was basically a mini-teaching on some aspect of our faith. This was followed by a talk given by either a teen or adult. Usually some discussion would follow that talk. Then the meeting ended with some spontaneous prayers for our needs and the needs of others. Following the official ending of the meeting, we always had what we called fellowship time which is just a Christianized way of saying that we would hang out, drink soda, eat snacks, and chat. A lot of teens came in and out of our group, but most of the teens who attended this group on a regular basis are still strong in their faith, and many have taken on leadership positions in our church and in the world. They've become music ministers, teachers, and youth ministers. Some have explored the priesthood and religious life. Others lead prayer groups. And many are faithful parents preparing the next generation of children to live for Christ. What made those who attended this youth group as teens such outstanding leaders today as adults is simply the fact that they made youth group a priority in their lives. Of all of the teens I've ever met, the overwhelming majority of those who are strongest in their faith and who've managed to stay faithful to Christ are the ones who made youth group a priority kind of spiritual support a youth group offers is extremely important for three main reasons. First of all, we live in a world where there are many forces opposed to faith, and these obstacles are encountered in an overwhelming way in middle school, high school, and college. If you haven't encountered these things yet, you will soon. These temptations include, but are not limited to, pressure to do drugs, drink, cuss, fight, talk about other people, and be sexually impure. 
While it's always a battle to remain strong in faith and resist temptation, it is an undeniable fact that it is easier to live for Christ when we have the support of others. Though negative peer pressure is strong, positive peer pressure is far more powerful. Gathering in Christ with fellow believers can not only help us to resist temptation, but a good group of supportive friends can even help us to avoid places and situations where temptation might be strongest. And the reason for all of this power in communities of faith is because of what Jesus said so clearly. When two or three gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. How about that? When we hang out with other believers, we automatically place ourselves in the presence of Jesus. And that is extremely powerful and totally cool. Think about it. Second, youth groups set us up with activities that give us opportunities to learn more about faith and actually experience God's love through a wide variety of things like prayer nights, teen masses, retreats, talks, youth conferences, and service opportunities. And third, youth groups are places where we can connect with trusted adults who really love us. Sometimes we have problems and we have questions that our friends cannot help us with, and the adult leaders of youth groups can be extremely helpful and insightful. I know lots of teens who've received invaluable help during hard times because they sought out the advice of youth group leaders. For all of these reasons, if you are not part of a youth group right now, I want to encourage you with all of my heart to join one. And if you're already part of a youth group, I encourage you to keep on attending and strive to become one of its most faithful members. Because if you make youth group a priority, God will bless you in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. I realize that some of you are reading this right now thinking, but Paul, my church doesn't have a youth group. If that's you, I want to encourage you to consider the following things. Number one, talk to your pastor. Number two, start a group. Or number three, broaden your search. Let me go through each of these. Talk to your pastor. If you don't have a youth group in your parish, I want to encourage you to talk to your pastor. I urge you to call him and ask for an appointment so that you can meet with him face to face. Then, when you meet with him, begin by telling him about your faith. Tell him your story, how you came to know Jesus in a deeper and more personal way, and let him know that you really want to grow closer to God. Trust me, he might need to hear that from you, just for inspiration and encouragement in his own faith. And while you're at it, ask for his wisdom on how to strengthen your faith. He'll probably give you some excellent advice on how to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up. Then, tell him that you're interested in being part of a youth group, and tell him why it's your desire. He may even be aware of a youth group in your church or at a nearby parish that you don't even know about. Or there may be other teens and adults in your parish who want to start a youth group that he can tell you about and put you in touch with. Start a youth group. My second suggestion is to start a youth group yourself, and it's not as crazy as it might seem. I remember once meeting a girl named Jess. Her parish had nothing to offer young people, and so she started a teen prayer group without the help of any adults. All she did was meet with some of her friends once a week, and this is what they did. They talked about their problems, they checked to see what the Bible said about their problems, and then they prayed for each other about their problems. That's a youth group right there. Your youth group doesn't need to be like Jess's either. Just spend some time thinking and praying about what you want in a youth group, and then start talking to some of your like-minded friends about your ideas. Your group could focus on studying the Bible, on praying the rosary, on praise and worship, on spending time together in adoration, on spiritual accountability. To know what that means, see the chapter of the book called An Indian Named Tonto. Or your group could focus on something else. Be creative. The possibilities are endless. You can get something started if you really want to. And there are probably trusted adults that you know who could help you. Ask your pastor if he knows of anyone. It just depends on how badly you want to be part of a youth group. Broaden your search. Another thing you can always do is broaden your search. When I was a leader for the youth group God's Gang, there were not a lot of youth groups in St. Louis with a spiritual focus. So, some students drove or had their parents drive them 45 minutes one way every Wednesday night to join us. They knew that youth group was important 
and they were willing to travel to get the spiritual support they needed. If you live in or near a big city, there are youth groups out there if you search for them. To find a youth group in your area, you can not only talk to your pastor, but you can call the youth office for your diocese. You can search the internet, or you can just start asking around. Again, you may need to travel to get to a youth group, and if you don't have a car, that can be difficult. But if you explain to some loving adults in your life why you want to go to a youth group, they'll probably help you to get there. Still nothing? In some situations, there will be people who've tried everything that I've suggested so far in this chapter, yet they still cannot find a youth group or can't get to one. And if that's you, I want to encourage you, hang in there and keep praying. Although it's difficult to follow Christ as a teen without being part of a youth group, it's not impossible. Jesus himself said, For God, all things are possible. He will sustain you if you remain faithful to praying, reading the Bible, and regularly receiving the sacraments of Eucharist and reconciliation. And while he's sustaining you, ask him to continue to send you what you need. If you have a computer and an internet connection, you could even check out some of the online communities for Catholic teens. Choosing a youth group. If there's a youth group in your parish, I encourage you to join it, even if it's not yet everything you think you need. I've known of some teens who, even though their parish had a youth group, chose to go to another youth group at another parish. And I know there are often very good reasons for this choice, because they get more out of it, because the other youth group is bigger, because they like the adult leaders more, because they have more friends there. Maybe it seems to be less clicky. A member of the opposite sex they like goes there there's better music, or the talks are more inspiring. In short, other parishes' youth groups can be more attractive. Although I totally understand the desire to go to a group that meets your needs, I want to encourage you to consider this. A parish youth group quite simply cannot grow into what God wants it to be when good people won't stick around. And as much as I love the mega youth groups out there, I know that their existence can be a drain upon smaller startup groups. If you have this struggle, I want to propose a solution that I believe is a win-win situation to the big youth group, small youth group issue. And the solution is inspired by the example of my friend John. While John was in high school, he attended two youth groups. One was a large, vibrant youth group at another parish where he was spiritually fed and was an active member. The other group was smaller, was less vibrant at his own parish, but it was a group that needed his presence and his leadership. By attending both groups, John remained faithful to his parish, he continued to grow in faith, and he enjoyed the opportunities that God gave him to both give and receive. John reminds me of what someone once shared about the difference between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea. The Red Sea is teeming with life because there's water that flows both in and out. The Dead Sea is dead because water only flows in. In other words, if we're only giving or if we're only receiving when it comes to our spiritual life, we won't be nearly as alive as we could be. I'll end this chapter with the quote that I shared with you near the beginning. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. I pray that you will always have really good friends and an excellent future, no matter where God leads you.